As a trauma survivor, I have always been interested in resilience. But growing up, I believed it was something that you were born with. Then in graduate school, I learned that it was a quality that we all possess and a set of skills we can all strengthen. Most of my resilience has come from writing and seeing myself in new ways by confronting the stories I've always told myself. The more I did that, the stronger I became, and I've dedicated my life to helping others do this work. This podcast is for anyone who wants to understand their story and how to revise it, because when we do that work, we change the world. I met Zavib Abraham through her fiance, my brilliant colleague, Lynn McLeod. Over the years, we've had many wonderful conversations about her work as a writer and psychiatrist, as well as our shared love of teaching classes that focus on writing and mental health. I've admired her oral storytelling performances and delighted in the essays and short stories she's written for places like Fantasy Magazine, Necessary Fiction, and The Rumpus, among others. Since recording her interview, I've also been overjoyed to learn that Zabib has landed an agent. She is now represented by C.L. Geisler at Art House Literary Agency. Congratulations, Zabib! During today's episode, we're exploring the difference between fiction and nonfiction writing and how to have compassion for yourself regardless of your chosen genre. Before you listen, I have a few questions for you. Have you ever considered whether something should be written as fiction or nonfiction? Do you wonder which genre might be the most compassionate to you and give you the greatest freedom to explore your emotional truths? Speaking of self-compassion, do you know what that term actually means and what it takes to cultivate it? I hope you'll ponder these questions as you listen to today's episode. And now I give you my interview with Zabib Abraham. Are you a writer who struggles with doubts? Do you wonder if your stories are good enough? Do you wish you had some simple tricks that would make the writing life just a little bit easier? Become part of my Writing and Resilience community by signing up for my newsletter. As a thank you, you'll receive a free copy of Write More, Fret Less, five brain hacks that will supercharge your productivity, creativity, and confidence. The link is in the show notes. Well, hello, Zabib. I'm so glad you're here today. Welcome to the Writing Your Resilience podcast. So happy to be here. So I'd like to begin by giving you a chance to tell us a little bit about yourself. What would you like us to know? Yeah. So I am a psychiatrist, actively working as a psychiatrist, and I'm also a writer. I like to write creative nonfiction, fiction, occasionally poetry. I've been a creative person my whole life. And in recent years, I've lived in many places. I grew up in Maryland in America, and then I lived in New York for about a decade, but then moved to Scotland to be with my fiance. And that's where you are right now. Yes, that's where I am currently right now at this moment. <laughs> and your fiance, who I also know and adore, has the most amazing Scottish accent. Absolutely. Growing up, I was always enamored with Scottish accent, Irish accents, etc. So of course, I would like her accent and it's definitely something that drew me to her, but also just uh, the fact that we shared so much in common. She's a writer as well. And you can't see this on the podcast, but right now I'm in our library surrounded by about a thousand books, literally. And I wish I was closer so I could see what the titles are, but yes, it's an impressive amount of books. Do you ever find yourself now that you're there and how long have you lived there? It's been a, a year or two, right? Oh, it's been three years. It's wild. Yeah. Time's flying. Uh, and I, 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 I love it here. I can't even believe it's been three years. It's just blows my mind. Do you find yourself when you're, especially when you're speaking with Scottish people that you're beginning to develop a bit of an accent or the brogue? I mean, does it ever come out? This is actually really funny because I will meet Americans who have that experience because they'll say they're American and I'm listening to them and I'm like, there's something odd about the way you're speaking, almost like you have taken on a bit of the brogue, but I don't think I have. Of course, you pick up words and you start saying like flat and lift and and chips or crisps. But no, I actually end up talking with a lot of Americans because there are a lot of people who have moved from America who live in Edinburgh. So it's very international. I'm not always around Scottish people. Oh, wow. I, I would not have known that. I mean, I haven't been to Edinburgh, but mm. that's really good to know. 
do, do yeah. you, have you said the word we as a joke <laughs> actually literally just yesterday i was calling something i was like i'll have a we little and then lynn's didn't like that because she was like well we is little but i, I thought it was funny to say a we little cup of tea <laughs> oh that's awesome yeah <laughs> that is what i would do yeah i mean as funny. an american but i could see <laughs> her having an issue with that Yes, yes. Like little sort of joke fights about how to say things properly. Exactly. So you are a prolific writer. I mean, I was looking Thank at this you. and you have so many things you've written and you've been working on three novels. What would you like us to know about these novels? Yeah, well, I think I'm most excited about the two novels I've written most recently. So I'm querying them to agents. And so basically that's just sort of like a waiting game. Some agents have requested the books. I, I'm. It's, it's funny when I write, I feel like I'm growing with each book. So then I'm the most excited about the one I've been working on recently. So that's a, a book called Terrible Animals. And I'm usually not great at titling. So I love that title. And it's about a, a woman in her late thirties who works at a literary center in uh, Brooklyn, and who is very positive and happy, almost toxically positive. And she starts to see this shadowy monster figure just appear first in her dreams and then in real life. And it starts to stalk her. And she becomes increasingly undone by this creature and disturbed. And it's basically like a metaphor for her facing a lot of the negative feelings and fears that she's avoided a lot of her life by just like focusing obsessively on positive thinking. And yeah, I think uh, with all these books, I'm a big cinephile. So obviously my books are influenced by books I've read, but also by movies. So I was thinking a lot about The Babadook and uh, a film called Happy Go Lucky, which came out in 2000 about a very like happy character. So I, I just was combining all of these ideas. So yeah, I'm excited about that one particularly. That is the thing about our writing projects. They are like our children, but also the newest one is the shiniest and we like it the most. Also kick-ass title. I love that too. You know, a lot of memoirists, which is one of the groups that I work with, I think it takes longer to write memoir just straight out, you know, because you are trying to do what I often say is describe your face without looking in the mirror, You're trying to do something incredibly difficult. And that is not to diminish the challenges of fiction because I'm working on a novel myself right now and it's hella hard too, right? It's, it's yeah. hard either way. How do you know your book is done? Like what tells you that this book is done and it's time to work on another one, given that you have three novels. And I know people who have worked on one thing for, you know, five, 10 years. Oh yeah, totally. That is a really difficult question, I think, and a good one because also with each book I've written, I've done it faster and being around Linz who works extremely quickly, we work differently. So I like shouldn't compare myself to her because she'll finish things quicker. But I think it's I have an urge to want to be done quickly and not work on something for a long time or years. So I'm always wanting it to be done probably before it is. But I think that for me, my process is like trying to just barrel through the first draft and then doing a couple of passes through. And then the I think the bad answer would be when I'm absolutely sick of it <laughs> and then a little bit past that. But yeah, for me, if I feel that most of the major core things I wanted to achieve in the book have happened and it's reading smoothly and I've removed excess and I've had at least one or two other people read it, then I would feel like it's mostly done or done enough to query. And then if I want to make any slight tweaks or if someone suddenly gives me like a bit of advice, and I don't know if that's the best guidance, but it's almost like it never is fully done. I agree. I think there is definitely the, the good enough level. And that's the thing you want to think about is what is good enough for you and also for the bar you're trying to reach, right? So if you yes. are wanting to publish in the big five, for example, or you're wanting to get an agent, there's going to be a certain bar that you have to meet, which is different from other forms of publishing. And it's not to diminish one over the other, but I think knowing what that is, and you talked about the idea of being sick of it. 
And you know, <laughs> for most of us, that is actually the sign that we're done. I mean, what I would tell people is if you're sick of it, it might be that you're tired. So pull back you know, and then do your due diligence, which you absolutely have done. You've had beta readers, you're thinking about, have I accomplished all the things? You know, is it reading smoothly? Have I taken out the excess? But, you know, once you've done that, if you're still sick of it and you feel like you've exhausted everything, it probably is done. And it's time to at least experiment with querying agents or other things. And then you're gonna get feedback that will tell you either, yes, it's it's done and it's reaching the bar that you're hoping to reach, or maybe you might want to go to the back to the drawing board or you want to try a different route. Well, I completely agree. And there's a lot of there's so much to that because you know you can get stuck in perfectionism and overthinking and fear of sort of exposing the work. And then on the other hand, you might be leaning more into avoidance of getting into the work and and having to do the very challenging work of editing. So yeah, the good enough balance, exactly what you said. Oh yes, procrastination. That can be, I mean, there's so many different ways to procrastinate and revising to infinity is one way to procrastinate because you are stopping yourself from moving on to whatever the next level is. And sometimes fear of being seen can be a big part of that. But then of course you might not be showing up to the page. And so there's lots of ways to do that, which are all psychological. And interestingly, all of your books have these psychological themes. Now I wanna, you know, you work as a psychiatrist. And so I'm curious to know, how your work as a psychiatrist influences this work that you do in a fictional world. And then a, a kind of a second question that goes with that is, why fiction? And why not make this creative nonfiction given the wealth of information that you have? Oh, those are both great questions. So I think for a, a while, maybe not even till the last year, uh, I really struggled with understanding or being comfortable with like my psychiatric world intersecting with the fiction world which doesn't make sense because it was already happening like the the way i think about the world is completely shaped by being in psychiatry so in one way it's like a chicken egg question because did the way i think about the world and and my creative way of thinking and all these existential questions i like to ponder lead me into psychiatry and then does psychiatry then inform those questions but i, I think I've allowed my experience in psychiatry and the patients I meet to at least touch on my fiction worlds. It's never nothing's ever based on a patient, but just sort of realizing like, okay, these patterns I'm seeing in people could inform things I'm doing with characters. And also the patterns I'm seeing more so in like family and friends and how as a psychiatrist, I'm, I'm noticing these things then are influencing characters from how I envision the character's childhood to their attachment styles, to their family. Like the family of the character is very important by either by their absence or their presence and the kind of relationship they have with their parents. I noticed that comes up quite a bit in all of these books and all of my stories. It's like the parents and then also, yeah, their, their um, assumptions about the world and others and, and trust. So those things just come up. So clearly I'm thinking about them a lot. And then fiction versus nonfiction is a huge question for me. I, can't, I don't even have the full answer yet because I started writing and for a lot of my life, it's sort of creative nonfiction, journaling and then personal essays. And then the first things I got published were creative nonfiction. And I was working on a memoir for a while. And then I had, for maybe good and bad reasons, a, a, a like need to go into fiction because I felt like, okay, this 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 creative nonfiction thing, I, I'm just sick of it right now. I can't I can't write about myself. I, I'm sick of it. <laughs> I don't want to deal with it. And also because I didn't want to deal with all the things that were coming up with it and then ongoing family drama. And also, I, I've always wanted to expand more in my fiction writing. So I do think I'll go back to writing a memoir soonish. That is a good answer. Soonish. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as a memoirist myself, I am feeling your pain because you can go into a dark night of the soul in writing memoir. And 
I talk to people all the time as a coach who have had tons of therapy and they've done their work. They're very resourced people emotionally. And they're like, I got this. I know what this is going to be like. And I'm like, "Mm, we will see. Because there is a way that when you are writing and seeing, you are reliving this experience. And that happens at the nervous system level. It can be a very powerful form of healing. Now, that doesn't mean that because it's you're healing and it's healed, it needs to necessarily be published. But there is this alchemy of, of you know work that's happening inside you as you're doing the writing. And when I think about the difference between fiction and nonfiction and why do you do this or that, I think sometimes it's what we're drawn to, where we feel like we can accomplish our goals or explore something in the best possible way. And also there's a different contract, right? So sometimes what makes a memoir powerful is the fact that this unbelievable bananas thing happened in our life and it's real, right? So so it's the reality aspect and, and this uh, almost unreality of the real that makes something powerful. But at other times you're limited by reality. And so a fictional world can allow you to push the boundaries on something, make, expand, contract, make something way bigger, hi, you know, use hyperbole. And that Absolutely. allows you to explore an issue in a way that cannot be explored in, a, in creative nonfiction because you have the bounds of reality and you cannot, if you don't like something, you can't change it, right? You have to keep it. I completely agree. And it's just great that you asked this because I was thinking about it a lot, is that it allows a certain, not that you can't be playful and imaginative in creative nonfiction, but a lot of my work will have things that are like magical or, you know, leaning into science fiction or maybe even a little horror. So I can use those metaphors to convey my experience. And also the characters are allowed to say and think things that I might not be ready to sort of say in a nonfiction piece or memoir. In fact, in recent years, I've been sort of semi-estranged from my mom. And I was trying to write an essay about this. And I was writing it and then realizing like, "Mm, am I really ready to be as like truthful as I want to be? Like, am I really ready to go there? Because what's the point of writing this if I think I can go to the other end of like not delving enough into what's hard. So no, I'll just write about difficult mother-daughter relationships in fiction. And then I'll use a metaphor of like a shadow monster to convey this like trauma and difficulty between family members. And it really like, it really works for me. Yeah. I love that answer. And I love that you are choosing the modality that allows you to go the deepest Because for some people, writing about your true life experience helps you tap into your resilience. It feels like it's the safest, truest, most important piece. And I think especially for people who have grown up in households where narcissism was an issue or an invalidating environment where you were told that your reality wasn't real and that, you know, however you feel is wrong, you should feel something else, then writing about how you feel and exploring those true feelings can be very powerful. But at other times, we aren't ready to go there, either because there's something going on inside ourselves, or we fear the repercussions that may come from other people if we go there, especially if it's something we might publish. And so autofiction, which is fiction about your life, but it's fictional, so you can push those bounds in the ways that you're talking about, can allow you to explore these really challenging issues in a way that you may or may not do in work that's creative nonfiction. Everything you're saying completely resonates. So yeah, exactly. And it's sort of like in its own maybe cocoon of semi-safety, this this fictional world you can create. So I agree it really that like autofiction space is what I'm really excited about now. It's kind of like memoir plus. You got to realize that you're going to feel a lot of things. And I mean, I think really good fiction writers also have profound emotional experiences when they're working on something, because even if let's say you're writing a space opera, which is something that Susan DeFreitas, she had this whole thing she wrote on the Jane Friedman blog about this and, and character arcs that even if it's out there and it's so far removed from what your day-to-day life looks like, there's going to be some emotional core that is 
touching into something tender inside you. And that's where some of the juice comes from when we are writing. Absolutely. And that's another thing I'm personally, and also I think, you know, everyone can work on who's people specifically who maybe aren't getting in touch with that like emotional aspect while writing. And I realized that I wasn't in the past. It, it was too intellectualized and that there could be a lot more truth and meaning if I was to a degree really connecting with the true emotion of any particular scene or character arc. And then you can, yeah, you can really, I feel like I can see that in my writing. Yeah. Wherever you can keep your heart open, that's the place to go. Cause that's where, that is where the best writing comes from and readers will see it and they will feel it when they are reading your work. I think that is so, so true. So you work as a psychiatrist. You've also taught courses in writing and mental health. What has the work you've done with your students and with your patients taught you about writing and about just the stories we have and how we inhabit them and how we create them? Because even in psychiatry, like when I worked as a, as a therapist, so much of the work was around, you know, the awfulness of what happened, but also the story you're telling yourself, because it's that interpretation, which creates suffering. Yeah, it's all the interpretation, because yeah, we each have our own individual lens in which we view life in the world. So what's interesting about teaching these classes is, first of all, I actually have to like learn a lot because it's not like all that knowledge is automatic that I can just apply to writing. And so I get to learn a lot as I'm, I'm looking into these things and asking people, like, what would you be interested in learning? So I think I've learned that people are extremely self-critical across the board and that that's like a major issue and that they're very invested in that self-criticism. So trying to get people to step back from that is extremely hard. It's so ingrained in a lot of people's view of writing that they need to sort of keep themselves accountable. Mm -hmm. So just talking with people, that theme comes up so much. And that also, I'm always so focused in, in these classes on like presenting people with as much useful information and insight as possible that I can sometimes forget. And then they, they remind me that it's also just about having the space to feel validated and to talk yes. through these things with people, right? So it's not just about craft and the the content of the writing itself, but about sharing just the the difficulties that come up in the journey and feeling like, oh, I'm not just like alone in this. I'm not just bad at writing. <laughs> like this is an experience a lot of us go through. So yeah, people that sort of teach me that, which I feel like I should remember that because I'm a psychiatrist. I'm like, yes, everyone can go through these things. But often when I'm writing alone, like I just, I'm like, oh, this is just a me thing. Oh, totally. Like when I'm there, I can get into my own darkness so easily and think like, oh my gosh, the work is terrible. And blah. But, you know, I think some of the ways we can be self-critical are habits we have based on experiences that we've gone through. You know, we we just, we go there because maybe when we were kids, it was protective, right? If, you, if you're critical of yourself, then you're gonna be mindful of what you're doing and maybe that will help keep you safe. So it's not a bad thing, right? It's not about shame. It's about something served you well in the past that doesn't necessarily serve you now. But what can also happen is that the writing community will say things like, you know, you got to be accountable. You got to write every day. You got to have a thick skin. And so we think that having a thick skin means being so critical of ourselves, no one can criticize us. It's almost like a shield, but it can be so detrimental. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can see it from like both sides where people will be sort of pushing this like narrative of relentless work and being immune to criticism and rejection, which is just completely not possible and not human. And then you also can see people who often embrace this hopeless perspective, at least online, you can sort of see this pattern of people feeling like, okay, well, 
I've queried like a hundred agents and I'm never going to get an agent and this industry is flawed. I'm like, well, absolutely is, but sort of complaint spiral, which can feel Mm -hmm. cathartic to a degree, but then people I think can get really sucked into the negativity uh, and hopelessness. So it's like, how do you find something that's not either of those things? (laughs) Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I'm going to tell you like what I, at one point when I started my healing journey, oh gosh, this was like in 2000. It's when I really started my healing journey. And of course it's, it's not something that I'm going to arrive at, right? I have complex trauma and I've done tons of work on myself and I have a nervous system that runs hot. So I'm always going to be doing work on myself and there's nothing wrong with that. But when I first started, I believed that the goal was to have this sense of Zen all the time where I didn't really feel a lot of things intensely, which at that time I felt a lot intensely. I struggled a lot with my emotions because I didn't understand them and I didn't have good coping skills. And so I've come to realize this and I, and I had this conversation with a therapist. I, I don't know, I think it was like 2007. I, I remember it going like, I realized something. All of this time I've been trying to be a good robot And I think I'm ready to be a good human being because only robots don't feel, human beings feel. Oh, absolutely. That resonates so much because I think partially that's been my experience and something I'm trying to unlearn. I'm at least the experience of, I want to be Zen all the time, like, and just this this sort of associating high emotion with just that's bad negativity and, and wanting to achieve Zen. And I think, I mean, for me, that really hampered me absolutely. And in accessing emotions or truth and flexibility in my writing. So yeah, I think people struggle with that. They also struggle with high emotions and not knowing what to do with them. So how do you work through that in writing? It's very difficult. Yeah, it can be a a huge challenge. And I think having boundaries around the writing, understanding, you know, what is intense for you and what is not, and that's usually a moving target. So, you know, I tell people all the time, like rate your, your writing based on the intensity it feels right now, you know, and some things we know, like if I write about that, it's going to feel intense, but there's plenty of times we're like, oh yeah, that's a one that doesn't matter to me at all. And then we start writing and we're like, holy fucking shit, that is huge for me and i had no idea so i think we we can run into that and what i always tell people is when that happens notice what's happening in your body and go oh there it is interesting i have i'm having an experience and then pull back from that experience like you don't have to keep writing and going there if it's causing you a lot of physical experiences like you know if your heart is racing if you are feeling really cold or really hot or you notice that you're trembling or you're you're having you know your stomach is sick that's a signal that you are moving into a trauma response and maybe it's time to take a break and just be with yourself and then you can decide, okay, what do I want to do with this? And, and that might mean continue writing, maybe in a different way, or maybe it's time to work on this with your therapist. It's so great. I actually, in the latest class I taught, which was about attention and writing, I think like you, you assume like, okay, attention, like that's going to be a lot about like time management and distraction and procrastination, but it all kept coming back to like the nervous system and to uh, emotion and and negative emotion that comes up with certain writing and not just, well, the subject of what we're writing Mm -hmm. and uh, assumptions we're making about ourselves while writing and what it means about our ourselves and our worthiness. So it's the idea of checking in with yourself and, and how you're physically and emotionally feeling while writing is something that I, I knew, but I had to sort of remember and relearn for teaching this class. And it's very hard to remember to do that, but just consistently remembering that you have a body and a nervous system and emotions that are going on while you're writing and just being curious about how you're doing. Yes. And it's so easy for all of us, no matter how much knowledge you have, it's so easy to forget these things. And that is the beauty of teaching is that it helps you remember and we all need those reminders. So some of the things that we were talking about before we got started today is like 
there's the work and then there's the inner work that you have to do in order to create a sustainable writing life. And so some of the things you talked about were radical acceptance, mindfulness, self-compassion. Let's go down that rabbit hole. (laughs) Yes, all amazing things that I think about a lot in my psychiatric work. And then in my own writing, and that come up a lot as themes in any classes I'm teaching about your mental health while writing. So I think those are pretty much the main concepts I think about with resilience with writing. And I think of resilience as having an ability to persevere, but also be flexible and sort of carry on, which you have to do because writing is inherently this like long-term task. So how flexibility can include being aware of how you're doing and taking a break if you need to, or shifting the task that you're working on or shifting the thing you're writing about. And being able to be flexible is a huge, huge thing in writing, I think. And I think of we we're also talking about like, okay, well, if, if we tell people to be mindful while they're writing, like, what does that mean? Is that necessarily a, a useful way of saying things for everyone? But really explaining that when we say being mindful while you're writing, that's useful. It's just about the different ways in which you can be present with yourself and attend to how you're feeling physically and emotionally and what's what's just going on with you mentally? What are the thoughts that are coming up in any particular moment? And just being curious about yourself so that you can then respond to that, attend to that, your needs, your physical needs. And yes, yeah, self-compassion. I, I read Self-Compassion by Dr. Kristen Neff. So yes, that's- I love that. Yes, I think I knew that actually. And I recommend that book for people if they want to explore the concept of basically- I think that self-compassion includes awareness of how you're feeling in the moment, being kind with oneself instead of being self-critical, and understanding that the difficulties that we're dealing with are uh, not just specific to us, but just part of the human condition, and that uh, as a whole, people are going through that. So that same sort of difficulty. So yeah, I think of self-compassion as kindness. It's not complacency. But choosing to sort of do the opposite of what you're used to doing, it might even feel unnatural, but leaning into treating yourself like you might treat a friend who is struggling or trying to do something as hard as writing. Absolutely. Thinking about this, what are some of the strategies that you teach people to help them be mindful and aware and to practice self-compassion? Yeah. So I think you know, a few things, even just like basic things like taking breaks and having like a a purposeful approach to writing, like noting that, look, okay, I, I, this is what I think I'm going to work on. And I'm going to take breaks this number of times. I'm not just going to try to write for hours without a break. I'm going to purposefully maybe check in with myself and how I'm feeling. I'm going to notice what's happening with my body, like how I'm sitting, my position, what's happening with my breath and, and, you know, just notice, or maybe try to do some deep breathing. And then also like people, maybe they don't love like affirmations, but you know, whatever you call it, (laughs) ways of maybe little reminder statements that you can find related self-compassion anywhere online or in books or just make up for yourself as like touchstones and and then have them maybe nearby just a few lines that can sort of trigger like oh yes this I'm, I'm trying to be kind to myself in this way so little things like that and also I think really being purposeful in what is my writing goal why do I want to write the thing I'm writing right now for who I think that if you're doing things for yourself, for this internal validation, rather than exclusively for external validation that builds your resiliency, really just not expecting way too much from yourself. Yes, Probably like you're trying to do too much and do less. That would be a big part of it too. Do less. Oh, that is a lesson I have to learn because I am one of those people who wants to do all the things 
all the time. It's very Me much too. my my airy Sagittarius way about of life. So yeah, doing less and and creating more ease in your to do list, I think is so important. And you talked about radical acceptance. I think that's a, a term I hear a lot. It becomes a buzzword. What does that mean? How do you practice it? Yeah, I feel like I'm constantly trying to explain this to patients and like sort of shifting how I explain it every time. But for me, radical acceptance is being open and present with the moment and not denying the reality of the moment, what's happening, how you're feeling, what's going on in your body. And again, acceptance of that and not resisting it, but it's not the same as being complacent. So whatever you're feeling and going through, facing that reality and not fighting with it, but moving with it, sort of like riding the wave uh, of it. And I think a lot of people feel like, oh, so if I'm feeling some negative thing, you want me to just be like, that's great. I'm like, well, no, no, it just, it is what it is. And I like how a supervisor once explained it to me that you don't want to take, I think this is a commonly uh, heard uh, metaphor, but like you don't want to take your pain and then struggle with it until it's suffering. This is to assume right in the moment that we were dealing with something difficult, but if you're experiencing pain that you can't force that away and that in fighting with things, we often can <laughs> make them worse. We can take whatever thought or negative feeling and then ruminate it on, on it more. So about sort of riding the wave of how we're feeling and facing truth and knowing that looking at something and, and acknowledging it is not necessarily dangerous, but helpful to us ultimately. Yeah. I love how you said that because I think some people think that radical acceptance is just, I'm okay, no matter what, and it's all good, whether I'm suffering or, or anything else. And I love what Marsha Linehan has to say. She is the founder of Dialectical Behavior Therapy, which is a great uh, set of tools that work very well for writers, and I teach them a lot. And, she, it, and what she says is, I'm okay, and I might need to change. Right. So it's not just one or the other, or I might need to do something different. So I am okay. I am whole. I am, I am fine just the way I am. And if I'm doing things that are setting me back or, you know, causing me pro problems or leading to suffering, I am okay. And I may need to change course. And that changing course is not a bad thing. There's no shame in it, but it's a, it's a way of kind of creating that both and experience. I love that. That could be one of the things that someone writes down on a post-it and has near them. Uh, in fact, I'll probably do that because I, I think I've heard that and I had entirely forgotten it. That's so beautifully simple, but effective because of course there are ways of growing and, and learning and how to understand ourselves and, and work through how we're feeling that will help us in our writing. But also it's the idea of like, I'm not necessarily trying to achieve some like ultimate optimized state in which then I'll be able to write and I'll, I'll, I'll be able to be worthy of doing it or competent to do it. It's that like, I'm okay as I am now and whole. And also there are things that can shift, which don't have to be, you don't have to think of it as this like self-criticism or finding fault, but just end things can change. Absolutely. And something that I find that requires radical acceptance inside myself is oral storytelling. So I've been doing some of that work. I'm very excited about that. And I've been in story slams, which is very fun. And for anyone who has not done this before, when we're talking about oral storytelling. Most of the time this, well, there's two kinds. There's live lit where you have your pages in front of you and you are performing them, right? So you are reading, but you are reading as performance. So it's not just a straight reading. You are adding voices and you're emoting and you're adding extra stuff to it. Story slams and other kinds of oral storytellings where you are telling a story, no notes. And it can't just be a hot mess and a ramble. It's got to have a beginning, middle, and end. You got to get somewhere. There needs to be an arc of change. All the stuff has to be in there, and you got to keep it all in your head. And 
when I do this, there's all this rehearsal and there's plenty of times where I totally screw it up and I don't know where I'm going. And it's so fascinating because it just, I experience it in a different way and it requires different parts of my brain. And because it's so new to me, I find myself having to, you know, say like, yes, I know about stories and this is a new way of telling stories. So I have to change how I operate and you also do this. So I'd love to hear more about your experience. Yeah. I mean, everything you said resonates. And I'm also, even though I've now done it a decent number of times, it still feels really new. And I sort of fell into storytelling in that in Scotland, there's such a rich artistic community and many, many opportunities. If you apply to things to do a workshop or a class for free. So I ended up getting selected for a program I applied to, to learn storytelling. And during COVID, so all on Zoom, where we met maybe five times or, or so with a really accomplished and fairly well-known storyteller. And she kind of just gave us the basics of how to do storytelling. And then we got to perform. And since then I've performed with the Scottish Tor Storytelling Center. And it's all like maybe five, 10 minute stories that are fully memorized. So no notes. And that has been such a learning experience because first of all, just like working through self-consciousness and how I express myself and allow things to like move through me and, and, and what I'm doing with my face and voice and all of that. It's really fun, but illuminating, <laughs> like where the limitations are. And the she kind of gave us this instruction of having like five or six beats that you figure out and that then you can sort of build a few details around that. So you have the five or six beats, there's going to be an arc because there's like some sort of initial trigger situation, then things are building to some sort of point and then a conclusion. And that's so helpful. And if you can even do that with your maybe memoir or with your novel, summarize the whole thing into five or six points, that would be really hard. But being able to do that, I think would be super, super helpful. Can I say five or six things that are sort of the main beats uh, of my story? And yeah, so having to like do that with a bunch of little stories has been a really great exercise. And then what details am I adding? What am I doing with my voice? Or what what are the few descriptors of sound or smell, like sensory descriptors I'm adding in or other characters? So very spare details. And then I practice it like a million times. And then that, once you've practiced it enough, then you could have flexibility. <laughs> Once you've like yes. memorized and practiced it, then you could sort of improvise a tiny bit. Yes, all of that. And and I think, you know, what my coach has told me is that you have to inhabit the story. So it's it's not even, I mean, you do memorize a decent amount. And I think this one person I worked with said, memorize 60%. So you want to memorize 60% and then it's the rest is inhabiting the story. And I find myself... I rehearse a lot. I rehearse everything that I do. It's just kind of my way. It gives me confidence and it helps me be centered when I'm doing that. So I, I don't apologize for it at all. So I think some people want it to seem like, oh, this is so effortless and I did it so easily. No, not necessarily. It looks easy because I did a lot of work, but I find myself like looking at my face because I, I find for myself as a trauma survivor, my face will be a little bit blanker. And I think that was a survival technique that I learned as a child. And so what's great about learning this is like, oh, I have to learn how to do stuff with my face. So I'm looking in the mirror and going like, what does anger look like? What does this other thing look like? How can I make my face not look weird? And <laughs> and then yeah. and then like, you know, how do you say something to convey the the emotion around it? Because, you know, let's go to the store. Simple benign thing. You can say that a thousand different ways, like let's go to the store or, hey, let's go to the store. And and just that little thing changes the tone of your story. And it's fascinating to me. I think it's so fascinating. And if you're in, I like that the person who was teaching you said inhabit the story, because if you're inhabiting the story, if you've practiced enough, at least for us, and you inhabit the story, you can, you'll be aware of when you can bring in those inflections and um, details and you'll know how to say, let's go to the store in the moment that it requires in that, because you're inhabiting that moment. Yeah. And I, I, when I work with students, 
and they're trying to do that on the page. I think learning oral storytelling gives me the sense of like, how does something need to be said? And then when I look at the page, I'm thinking punctuation. Does a word need to be italicized? Do we need to break this up with an action? Like, how can we do this in a way that shows hesitance or urgency or intensity? And I think there are a thousand different ways to do that. But when you read things out loud and you really get a sense of what does something need to sound like, and that's what oral storytelling does, then you can come back to the page and say, how do I recreate that in a written form? That's so great. I think we had been discussing things that we might bring up and and one of them was like best piece of writing advice you received yes. and read out loud. <laughs> and, you know, it's okay. You know, if you don't want to do that, cool. But I really, really think that reading out loud, which I also really don't want to do often. I just kind of want to like, when I'm doing my edits, I just want to like run through the page and get through it quickly. But reading it out loud, you really notice the rhythms of things, the repeated words, the excess that you would notice in oral storytelling. Like I notice in oral storytelling, if I've used the same verb like four times, I'm like, now I got to change that. So reading out loud is so crucial and really interesting way to learn about your writing. 100%. And I often tell people it is not optional, my friends, you've got to do it. And in fact, I, I must read everything out loud. That is so important. And even an entire book. So yes, I have read whole books out loud. Usually I have to take breaks. There's lots of tea involved, but <laughs> it really helps you understand things. And then what I find is also helpful is Microsoft Word and other applications will read it to you. And that is interesting because when you read it, you're gonna add in all this inflection and all of the stuff that you want to be there. You get a robot voice to do that and it's not there, you are also going to catch some things. Absolutely. I've done that too. And like looking up certain apps and then get, getting the right voice that sounds somewhat normal and, and then just listening. And, and I mean, it's like, oh my gosh, it's it really brings it alive <laughs> in a way that's sometimes too much. You're like, oh my gosh, like why is this paragraph going on and on and on? But yeah, then that I, I recognize like this is how I'm reacting to it. Yeah, so I think absolutely great advice. And that's where mindfulness comes into play because when you're listening and you know, how do you know that something is too long? It's your body's reaction. I'm bored, my muscles are tired, or I want to fidget and check social media. If you want to check social media, something's going on with that piece and it needs to be revised. And no shame around it, right? We all get there, we've all got that stuff. But yes, so I love that you you said that. What helps you be a resilient writer? What are your tools that you fall back on? Yeah, and this is, I think, things I'm literally learning in real time and then teaching to people if I do classes um, or my patients. Um, yeah, so I think doing less, like we said earlier, is a is a big issue for me and that I really want to get a lot done. I want to push myself really, really hard. So how do I balance pushing myself to a degree where I might not have done that before and also giving myself parameters and, and, and breaks? Uh, I think that's a huge thing that helps me just be like flexible and not like too hard on myself and sort of uh, relentless in the work because I will lose effectiveness over time and have uh, difficulty like maintaining my energy on a long project. So I think it's something I still struggle with. So I go back and forth on and, and try to remind myself again and again, connecting with others, like having a network of trusted people that you can maybe share your writing with, or just talk about the process of writing with. I even enjoy just doing silent writing sessions with people. That really helps because it's like something to mix it up. It's like the, someone to share the determination of like writing in this hour with. And I, I really enjoy my little writing groups when we meet and do Zoom and then go silent <laughs> for an hour. And so having those connections really, really helps me. And switching up what I'm writing, I could not maintain resiliency if I was just struggling through the same project and that's all I ever worked on. So, okay, I'll work on this project. And then when do I take a break to read or take a break to write this other short story, things like that in general. Also just sleep, 
exercise. And of course, this is all dependent on whatever someone's health and medical conditions and physical state is. But for me, I know when I'm messing with my sleep and mm -hmm. not maintaining routine. So routine is huge. It just really grounds me, it just makes it easier to just show up if, if you're well rested and used to showing up to write in the same way. Absolutely. And I love all of those strategies. And I hope that everyone writes them down because they're so important. So if you listen to this once and you're like, oh, I didn't get it all. Listen again, come back to these points because they are excellent. If people want to find you out in the world and read your writing, what is the best way for them to do that? I would say my website. So I try to keep that updated. ZK Abraham, like Abraham Lincoln.com. So I will put all my writing there. And then social media wise, I'm now mostly on Blue Sky, uh, wow. <laughs> which is like a new social media alternative to Twitter. But, you know, Blue Sky, if you want to get Blue Sky, you can message me on my website if you need a code. Also using my contact form on the website if you have questions about anything. Well, all of these ways of connecting with you will be found in the show notes. So if you didn't catch all that, it will be there. Zabib, I want to thank you so much for all of the wisdom that you brought to us and for being on my podcast. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for your wisdom. Hey writers, have you started a memoir only to get lost in a sea of stories that never seems to end or completed a few drafts and now wonder if the structure you've chosen for your memoir is the best one for your book? Or have you queried a few agents only to hear, sorry, it's not for me or worse, radio silence? You might not know this, but structure is the concept writers struggle with most. They worry about it during their first drafts and all along the way. And there's a very good reason why this happens. An ineffective structure can lose readers, trap you in an endless cycle of revision, or worst of all, get you so lost you give up. But that doesn't have to happen to you. On February 21st, I'm teaming up with Jane Friedman to bring you Find the Memoir Structure That Works for You. During this webinar, you'll discover why writers crave structure and why stories need them. You'll also learn how to assess your skills and vision for this project, explore the most common memoir structures, and find out what skills are needed to nail each one. Best of all, it's only $25. That's right, $25. Plus, you don't even have to be available on February 21st because everyone who registers will get the recording, transcript, Q&A, and my comprehensive workbook. To learn more or register, go to janefriedman.com forward slash courses or make it super easy on yourself and just click the link in the show notes. You'll leave with a new understanding of not just how stories are told, but confidence in your vision for your book, as well as a clear plan for getting there. To find the memoir structure that works for you, click on the link in the show notes, then register for this course. That's it for today's episode. Before you leave, I would love your help spreading the word about this podcast. You can do this in a few very simple ways. Click on the subscribe button in the upper right-hand corner, then leave a five-star review. You can also let me know what you think or share ideas for the podcast by connecting with me on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, or through my Writing Your Resilience newsletter, which you can have delivered directly to your inbox.